All right. Hey, thank you very much, Aaron. Um, for everybody who's joining us for just a few minutes uh, during this day, I want to first of all thank you for your time. It's great having you. I know that time is the big equalizer. We all have just the same amount of it, and it's very, very precious. So our objectives for you and I in this 30-minute webinar are three basic things. Number one, we want to identify some common scanning methods that attackers and hackers not only can use but are using against networks today. Secondly, I want to share with you some valuable resources that hackers are using just so that we're aware of what they're doing and how they're doing it. And then third, actions that we can take to help improve the security of our networks and our systems. And the, the thought here I'd like to share with you is this. As we take a look at some activity, some hack, or some crack that an attacker is doing, at the same time of hearing that, we should be thinking, okay, are we vulnerable to that? And if so, start the process of how might we set up a countermeasure to protect ourselves. Because the hackers that are out there are driven by different motivations. Not everybody has the same motivation. For example, um, I'm not going to go over each of these in uh, great detail and explain each one of them, but just to, as far as a couple of these. A suicide hacker is somebody who doesn't care about getting caught. <laughs> they, they're, they could be disgruntled or upset or they have a cause or what have you, but they just, they're going to do damage and they don't care about covering their tracks. So that's, that's one extreme. A black hat is someone who is absolutely beyond the law or they think they are. They don't follow the rules. They don't have care for what the laws of the land are. And they'll just do whatever they need to do or want to do based on what they want to accomplish. On the other side, we have a white hat who is absolutely caring about the law, is never going to do anything illegal. And what I want to do is I also want to point out that as we learn the techniques of ethical hacking, the reason why it's important for us to understand how the hackers operate and what they can do is so that we can think like a hacker in the effort to protect our networks. We would never want to do anything that would compromise our integrity or compromise our freedom, meaning you don't want to go to jail for anything. Um, so depending on the motivation for a hack, any one of these types of hackers or attackers could be using a wide variety of tools. And so I'd like to talk with you, before we get into scanning, let's take a look at the big picture of the phases. Now, Kevin Mitnick, one of the world famous hackers, um, back when he was a young teenager, he was hacking telephone systems. And his mom was contacted and said, you know, Kevin's got to stop, he's got to stop. And I think she might have thought to herself, oh, it's just a phase he's going through. And what she might not have known is it was just a hacking phase, one of many that he was going through. So it starts off with reconnaissance to discover what exactly is out there. And reconnaissance involves using passive tools, and we'll take a look at some of those great tools that can be used to learn as much about the target or the victim as we can. And once we've gathered boatloads of information and we've made a good footprint of that company or that victim, then we can start our scanning, which is more of an active process. So reconnaissance and footprinting is more passive and then scanning is more active. And then we want to gain access. And like a good politician, a good politician wants, oh, I'm sorry, is that an oxymoron? Sorry, let me back up. An objective of a politician is two things. Number one is to get elected. Number two is to stay elected or get reelected. So for an attacker or a hacker, they want to gain access, and then they want to go ahead and maintain that access as well. And when possible, they want to do it completely anonymously. They want to cover their tracks so they can't be identified or can't be followed up on. So as far as passive information gathering, the reason this is important for the attacker is they don't want to waste their time. If they can find easy, low-hanging fruit, that's the attack they're going to go ahead and use, or that's the, the vector they're going to use to gather that information. And then as they reduce that focus area and identify vulnerabilities, once they get in, then it's a lot easier to do enumeration and scanning of the rest of the network once they're in. So as far as passive information gathering, here are a lot <laughs> Here's a boatload of options. Search engines. Now, we all know how search engines work. We put in a term, and it responds with some information. However, it's possible 
that if there is a list of vulnerabilities or some vulnerable systems, and they all have a certain string in a URL, because lots of systems, firewalls, systems, operating systems, etc., have graphical user interfaces. And as a result, many of them are running web services. And if a specific vulnerable system has a certain string, we could use a Google search for that string. And, one of those, and that's called Google hacking. And it does not mean we're trying to hack Google. Google hacking refers to using the services of Google to help find target information without having directly to go to that customer site. For example, there's something called the Google hacking database. And I'd like to draw your attention to this right, well, look at the dates on these. And now as of this recording, these are all fa <laughs> fairly current. And these little check marks indicate that they've been verified. So if we wanted to do the Google hacking database search and look for vulnerabilities here, check this one out right here. There's one of them. Just as an example, looks like an IPsec, IKV1, IKV2 buffer overflow that a Cisco ASA is susceptible to. Now, hopefully, and I'm sure it happens or is about to happen, um, companies who identi get identified with a weakness or a vulnerability are then going to go ahead and do a patch or an update to correct that. But until they do or until a company does, that's a vulnerability. So if we clicked on, for example, that link, and just using it as an example, it goes into the details for that exploit, how it works, and it, it doesn't take a lot of programming and engineering to actually launch an attack that's going to leverage a vulnerability. So the process might be to scan for that link or scan for that type of system, and then when you find it, try loading the payload of that the vulnerability to take advantage of that, or launch an exploit that takes advantage of that vulnerability. Here's a, another example of Google hacking database. So with Google hacking, let's take a look at this one right here. Uh, by the way, these are all files containing usernames. And so basically, here's the string in URL colon, and it has the whole, and it builds it for you. So we don't even have to actually craft all of these ourselves. There's tons of options and switches that we can use with Google, and a lot of them can lead to well-known or possible vulnerabilities. So if a person was to do that search, and if that search came up with results, there's also a higher potential that we could compromise based on that information. Well, and also we could add on sites. For example, site, colon, and then the victim site that we're looking for, and that would narrow that search down just to that website itself. And then if we go just one step further, um, it has details on, you can actually click on the link right here, <laughs> and that actually launches the search for you right from the Google Hacking Database uh, that's out there on the web. Okay, so going back to a tools that hackers might use, there's a lot of publicly available systems that hackers can use, like Google and like uh, DNS and social engineering that can be used to gather information about the victim to narrow down our attack focus to compromise that, that victim or the purpose the person or entity that we're attacking. I say we, that's the royal we. Of course, you or I would never do any type of hacking or penetration testing without written authorization from the correct parties involved. Now, as far as the scanning goes, once we've taken a look at gathering information, if we move into active scanning, here are the basic eight ideas, if you will, regarding active scanning that we could use. We want to look for live systems. With the, what devices on the network are up and available. And then once we identify those devices based on some type of a sweep, we can then check for open ports. And the question might come up, well, Keith, how is that going to help us finding out what ports are open on the system? Well, the reason that's going to help us is because if we find ports, for example, if we find UDP port 123, that's the well-known port for network time protocol. And network time protocol can actually divulge information about other systems on an NTP server that it has peering relationships with, that it has clients. If we see port TCP 80, we know it's a web server. If we see port 23 for TCP, we get very excited because they've got a telnet service running. <laughs> and if they're doing management of their system with telnet, it's clear text. We could then do a man in the middle attack and do some or a sniffing attack and then just eavesdrop to find out the credentials. And then once we have the credentials, then we could log in and pwn the system or own the system. And then during that process, of course, we don't want to get caught. We're going to want to evade. 
IDS. There's a whole host of methods we can use in protecting ourselves, including using a proxy or a victim, a compromised system, to do our further scanning of the network. So it's not coming from the actual attacker itself. We can identify the types of servers that are running, again, looking for vulnerabilities. A company should be doing their own vulnerability scan. For example, we would want to know if Bob's computer has TCP port 80 listening on it. Why? Because Bob shouldn't be running a web server. That's, open, that's an attack vector that could be used. And Bob shouldn't be running a telnet server. And if there's other ports that are open, basically representing services that are running Bob's computer, we want to know about that. So scanning methodology begins with documenting who's out there doing port scans, and then taking a further step into identifying the services, the operating systems, the applications, so we can further compromise the system. Now, one of the things that I strongly recommend, and this will help keep you out of trouble as well, is that as you're learning ethical hacking for the intention of identifying vulnerabilities and weaknesses and how to set up countermeasures, I would encourage you to build your own lab. And this is so important because we, we really, in a production environment, as far as testing attack tools and hacking tools, it's usually never allowed, and it's also usually never a good idea. If you're being paid, if you and I walk into a company and they're paying us to do penetration testing, they're going to give us specific requirements regarding what we're allowed to do, what we're not allowed to do, and then we're going to want to comply with those every step of the way to keep out of trouble, to make sure we have that get out of jail free card based on our pre-authorization. So a lab environment is a great way to build and test and practice our hacking skills again, for the purpose of improving the security of our networks. And so uh, at CBT Nuggets, we've got one of our courses, is the Certified Ethical Hacker version 9, which I'm currently about three quarters of the way done creating. And in that course, I walk you through step by step on building a practice lab. And you can do it all with the evaluation software. And that way, you can build a practice lab to practice without anybody getting hurt. Now, another, another really important aspect in doing hacking of any type, ethical hacking, is to have some networking knowledge. So for example, some familiarity with the OSI reference, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, model would be a great idea. To also understand how the actual TCP IP protocol stack works would be a great idea as well. Understanding how frames at layer two work, how packets operate at layer three, how segments of data with layer four protocols like TCP, UDP, GRE, IPsec, and others that operate at layer four of the OSI reference of the protocol stack, and then the application layer, and generally how those pieces work. So leveraging just a little bit of networking knowledge, let's take a look at how an attacker might do an active scan to discover what hosts are available on the network. And it would go something like this. The attacker could send out an ICMP echo request. ICMP is protocol number one. I'm not sure why it got number one. It's like, I'm number one. I'm number one. I'm ICMP. I'm protocol number one. Anyway, sends out an ICMP echo request. And if their response comes back, for example, looks like Sally here, sends an ICMP echo reply, the attacker now knows that this IP address, dot 12, is on the network. Now, dot 11 up here didn't send a response back. So does that mean that dot 11 is not a real host on the network? No. A lot, of soft, a lot of operating systems have firewalls that are stateful, that are not going to respond to a ping request or anything else unless they initiated the conversation. So there's some tricky, pretty cool tricky things that an attacker can do. If we had an ICMP echo request that we sent out and we didn't get a response back, it doesn't mean the system is down. It means the system possibly is up and didn't want to respond. That's also an option. So here's Here's a tricky, uh, one tricky way of getting around that. Instead of sending out ICMP echo requests, how about sending out ARP? Now, when we talk about ARP, we are not talking about the Association for the Advancements of Retired Persons, which, by the way, now that I'm over 50, I qualify for. Woo! I'm officially old. But ARP is the Address Resolution Protocol, and it's used by TCP IP for IP version 4. And with ARP, Basically, what we do is we send an ARP request and we say, hey, I'm looking for, it's a broadcast, I'm looking for the owner of the IP address 
And if this guy hears that ARP request and responds back with an ARP response, the attacker smiles and says, got him. That's an active device on the network. So even if we're firewalled at layer three for ICMP or what have you, or layer four, we can still do ARP requests across the entire network on the local network, and everybody who responds, which is every active IPv4 host, is going to go ahead and respond back. And as a result, that's another way of doing a sweep of the network to identify which hosts specifically are on the network. And there's lots of really great tools that can help do that, including things like Nmap and like 50,000 other scanners that also have similar capabilities. So one of the benefits of having a little network knowledge is that the attacker uh, can use that information and know what the basic operation of the protocol stack is and then leverage it. For example, let's say the attacker has already done their sweep of the network. Maybe he did an ARP request for an entire subnet and everybody's responded who's there. He now knows which devices exist. He can then go ahead and do a TCP request. Now, a traditional three-way handshake in TCP, transmission control. <laughs> it's like, Keith, what does TCP stand for? Transmission control protocol. It, TCP, gosh, I use the acronym so much, I never expand them. So anyway, with TCP three-way handshake, the normal procedure would be this. Bob or the client would send out a TCP synchronization request. The server listening on that port for example, here it's port 23, would respond back and give an acknowledgement regarding a gotcha synchronization request, and it would give its own synchronization request, at which point Bob would follow that up with a packet that says acknowledging, uh, include the acknowledgement flag, this is I got your synchronization request and the three-way handshake has been completed. So that's a tr traditional three-way handshake operates, and here is a flag right here, the SYN flag that's set in the TCP header. I often like using protocol analysis to help reinforce that the concepts are actually matching up with what's really happening on the network as well. It's a great reinforcement tool. And when a TCP session is done, they can go ahead, the two parties can formally close the TCP session by using a logical sequence, effectively saying I'm done, and both sides say goodbye, they part, and then the session is formally closed. Now an attacker can leverage this information with a process called port scanning by sending a TCP SYN request. In this example, he's doing a SYN request to port 80, which is the TCP well-known port for HTTP services. And if the server gets it and sends back a SYN ACK, the attacker says, hey, port 80 is open and listening on that server. And then instead of completing the three-way handshake with an acknowledgement, the hacker can send a reset and then move on to the next victim or move on to the next port. Maybe he's scanning 1,000 or 10,000 or 60,000 ports across his server trying to identify all the ports that are open. On the other hand, if the attacker sends a syn synchronization request to port 80 and he gets a reset back, he knows that that server is not listening on port 80. Uh, there, it could also be filtered. So it could be a, a situation where we have some filtered traffic or the port's closed, but he knows that the, the port is not open and listening on port 80 on that specific server which is all part of the reconnaissance and scanning process. And then once we've scanned the network, we've identified the devices, and then we've done our port scanning, and there's lots of, there's lots of different options of doing port scanning. Some are more aggressive than others. Some can actually use a third-party device. We get very, very tricky, so we're not direct, directly scanning that victim ourselves. But after we've identified the ports, we can then start the enumeration process and discovering additional information. For example, if we compromise a user account, or if we know what the SNMP password is, or if they're using default passwords, or if they're using their login names, the same as their email addresses, we could use email to help verify which names do or do not exist. We could gather NetBIOS information. We can gather all types of information from the systems that are sitting there on the network that are just willing to let us or provide that information. And then we'd focus on our best likely, best, our are most likely victims and systems to gather information. What we're doing is we're looking for vulnerabilities, which is some kind of a weakness. That weakness could be built into the operating system. It could be built into the app. It could be a module that an app is using. It could be a configuration mistake. So if there's a vulnerability that makes it really easy to compromise, we can use an exploit that takes advantage of that vulnerability and helps us either own the system or get information that otherwise we shouldn't have got. 
And then as we start targeting a specific system, there's basically five system hacking phases. Gaining access of some type, escalating that access, running programs like remote control apps or root kits or other software that can help us maintain that access as well and gather information. We don't want to be caught. We're going to hide our files and then hopefully cover our tracks, which includes log files. And maybe we turn off auditing as the very first thing we do once we own the system. And then when we're done, we turn back on auditing. So if anybody goes back and looks at the details, they'll have a harder time in knowing exactly what we did or what was done to compromise their network. So one of the, one of the challenges is that there's so much software that can be run. And users, when they go out to the internet, if they launch an application, they click on an email, it's very easy to compromise a system. So a couple of strategies that companies often take. Number one is make sure you have very limited rights for your users on their computers. For example, it's not very typical to have Bob, the user, have admin rights on his system. We don't want Bob inadvertently or maliciously installing any additional software, key loggers, root kits, malware, viruses, et cetera, et cetera, on his system. We'd also, in a perfect world, which I know we don't live in, but in a perfect environment, we'd want to do a profile of every system before it gets on the network. So if somebody plugs into a jack in the wall, before they're given access and given um, full access to the network, if we had some system that could profile that device, for example, maybe install an agent, go through that, find out what ports are open, find out what virus software is running, what anti-malware software is running, uh, verify that certain services are not on or verifying certain services are on, we could then go ahead and posture a device before we allow it to get on the network. And that's expensive. It's not simple. Um, but network admission control is a big step in the right direction for controlling what users do and how they get on the network. So as far as getting really good at anything, it's going to require hands-on practice. So in this, nugget, in this webinar, we wanted to take a look at common scanning methods, which we've done. We want to take a look at valuable resources that hackers can use. And we I showed several. We touched on Google hacking and some methods that, that could be used to compromise a system. And as far as actions we could take, the best thing to do is to learn about what the attackers and hackers could be doing, are doing, and then every time you come up against one of them, you can then start to identify, okay, how would we implement a countermeasure? And countermeasures are generic in concept and vendor specific with the implementation. For example, if we know, and let's go back to, um, let me go back to one slide here. Let's imagine that this attacker wants to do what's called a man in the middle attack between Lois and let's say a server that Lois is talking to. So Lois has a communication going between her, her computer and the server. Let's say the server is at dot 100 on this network. If Bob set, uh, starts lying, now spoofing is lying. So if we start spoofing the layer two addresses, in Ethernet, there's a layer two MAC address that's associated with each network interface card. Let's say the attacker MAC address is AA. And the servers, although they're, it's 48 bits, and 12 hexadecimal characters, but for this conversation, let's just use couple. And let's say the Windows server or the server is BB for the MAC address, and Lois's computer is CC. So the, through the process of ARP, uh, Lois and the server know exactly which MAC addresses are each other's, and then they forward frames with those correct layer two addresses. If the attacker sends out gratuitous and spoofed ARP messages to the server, and it says, hey, Lois's IP address is reachable via MAC address AA. And if the hacker sends out spoof messages over to Lois and says, hey, the server's MAC address is available, the server's IP address of dot 100 is available at MAC address AA, effectively, all the traffic going between the server and Lois are now going to the attacker. And what he could do is simply continue to forward it to the correct layer two address after he processes it. And as a result, he can go ahead and discover and have a man-in-the-middle attack, now he's eavesdropping on all that traffic. Now, what, now, learning about that, what can we do? To solve that, one popular implementation is called DAI, and that stands for Dynamic ARP Inspection. 
and there's some prerequisites to get it working. Number, <laughs> and you'd have to have a device, a switch, a layer two switch that supports it. You need some additional features such as DHCP snooping. It's the shizzle and dynamic ARP inspection effectively makes sure that any layer two addresses that the attacker or any device is sending out have to be correct for what's associated with that device. It basically prevents a layer two spoofing attack from being implemented by this attack device on the network. And the switch simply won't allow those frames to go through, thus preventing the attack. So again, for every type of attack that might be used to compromise our network, we would look at what is the generic option that we could use to solve it, and then look at specific vendors' tools like HP or Juniper or Cisco or Brocade or whoever as far as a solution for helping to mitigate against that threat. So in a lab environment, I would, lab, I would encourage anyone to lab up the various techniques, verify that they are functional and working, and then make sure that your network, it has the right countermeasures to help mitigate against those threats. So, I mean, virtualization is so amazing. Uh, we can virtualize an entire network on one computer using you know, VMware and GNS3 and um, Microsoft's uh, virtualization software. There's lots and lots of options to virtualize our operating systems, our network devices, to the point where we can actually set up some really good tests and verifications in our lab before we ever go out to the public environment. Now, people might have a question saying something like this. How do I, how do I freaking start? How do I start this process? Well, if you're brand new to networking and brand new to systems, this might be a growth path. And you can go ahead and pick, yours, pick up wherever, you're, wherever you currently are. So CompTIA Network Plus is a great foundation course. And before that, there's CompTIA A Plus for basic computers. So A Plus, Network Plus, I think everybody on the planet should have at least a CCENT, that Cisco's entry-level networking certification, or the equivalent knowledge. You don't have to go get the cert, but I do recommend you have at least that knowledge. It's a good overview of basic networking. Then there's CompTIA Security Plus, vendor neutral, which is a great thing gives you eyes on the big picture of where we might look for security issues and breaches and how to solve problems with generic solutions. And then the vendors, of course, would implement those solutions. And then vendor-specific operating systems, things like Microsoft and Linux, uh, networking, uh, companies like Juniper, companies like HP, companies like Cisco, security. Uh, for security, Palo Alto, Checkpoint. Uh, Cisco has an offering in security and other, uh, other specific products for specific solutions, and apps. Maybe you want to learn to be a little bit of a developer so you can understand apps better. Maybe you want to do some, uh, some Python or Java or what, some other type of scripting language to help just be aware of those tools and how they operate. And then CEH, Certified Ethical Hacker, CISSP, and there's a host of other and very extensive hacking and security related certifications that are out there. So that might be a possible growth path pick up wherever you need to pick up, and just to make sure every step you take is in the right direction. Because you're, we're, we're never going to solve security overnight. In fact, we're not going to solve security in my lifetime or your lifetime. Uh, because every time we have a new system or service or function, it, there's a lot of complex pieces. And anytime there's a possibility for a vulnerability or there's a possibility for a human interaction that could be compromised with social engineering, there's a possibility for a security failure. So that's a, um, security is a great field. I, I love it. I've been doing security for um, ever, ever since I did like Novell back in the 80s. Um, security was a concern then. And now, 30 years later, it's way more important and it's got to be baked in. Baked in, not sprinkled on, is how security needs to be. Here's some of my contact information if you need to or want to reach me. Um, you can also just Google me. Um, I'm Googleable on the internet as well. And what I'd like to do is take a few moments and ask some questions. In fact, there's a whole bunch in the queue. Let me see if I can take a few of them right now. Um, first question is, with solid foundation, let me go to the questions page here. With solid foundation networking, where should I start to become a valuable ethical hacker? <laughs> I like that idea, valuable. I would start with the basics. And the basics, like the starting point for hacking in general, for ethical hacker is EC Council's Certified Ethical Hacker. 
and the current flavor is version 9. So that's where I would start. It's certainly not an ending point. It's like the, I think of it, uh, I'm going to say it, I think of it like the, the entry level for hacking. It will give you a great exposure on a lot of the concepts and terms. Certainly it's not where you go, oh, I'm a certified ethical hacker, I'm now going to go out and consult for, you know, a huge company and be their, their quote unquote security expert, but it is a great starting point is CEH. Um, let's see, I'm going to take one more and then we're out of time, I apologize. Um, uh, Cameron's asking, how about Fortinet? Fortinet is great. As far as what, she, what a person should study, here's what I'd recommend. As you get through the basics, for example, you've got networking fundamentals down, you've got basic security down, whatever the company is, if you're doing consulting for somebody and they have a certain product, I would take the time to get really good with that product because you have the opportunity to not only know it better, but also to apply that knowledge as you support that company. So if your company is running Microsoft, boom, spend some time learning the operating system and Active Directory for Microsoft. If the company you're working at is even like F5, for example, and Big IP, their solution, learn it and use it. So we don't want to make changes without proper change control, but we certainly want to learn the products to be more valuable to the customers that we're serving. And uh, for other questions, if you, um, <laughs> I'm going to, we have to close, but if you have other questions that you'd like to ask, um, I'm hoping that Aaron is going to give you some mechanism for doing that. Um, on behalf of everybody at CBT Nuggets and for everybody who shared a few minutes with me today, I absolutely appreciate your time. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron for a few closing remarks.